Okay, so the topic of this video is homeostasis and the body's ability to maintain an internal balance. So let's get started. Okay, so homeostasis is the process where the body maintains a constant internal environment. And the reason this is so important is because the internal chemical reactions that are taking place right now to keep us alive, you know, they, re they depend upon enzymes to help perform these chemical reactions. And enzymes work in very, very specific conditions. For example, the human body, 98.6 degrees Fahrenheit, 37 degrees Celsius. If our body temperature rises or falls, if it fluctuates too far away from this normal set point, then many of those internal chemical reactions just won't proceed. The enzymes lose their ability to function. And so we have control systems in place in order to uh, maintain uh, our, not just our body temperature, but what else is controlled? The percentage of our blood sugar, for example, and the pH of our blood. If any of these levels deviate too far from normal, we could suffer some pretty severe side effects. So let's talk about the control systems in place in order to maintain our homeostatic levels. Well, let's begin with the sensors or the receptors. What they do is they gather information about the body and the environment. In this example, in the skin of the woman's fingers are thermoreceptors. These are heat receptors. Notice she's getting too close to a candle. And so the heat is going to activate her communication systems. In other words, messages are going to be sent through the body in order to respond. Signals, in this case, an electrical signal called an impulse, will travel up the woman's arm and into her brain. Well, speaking of the brain, we now have the control center. And what the control center does, it receives information from the sensors. And in this case, it's, it's the brain. The brain is interpreting this impulse as a temperature uh, impulse. And the brain is going to respond by sending a signal to the target. The target is the body part that needs to change its activity. In this case, the brain is going to send a signal back to the hand. And so, in this case, the hand would be the target. And the hand has muscles that can pull away and remove the fingers from the heat to prevent any further damage. So a good example of the various control systems maintaining balance. Okay, let's start talking about the feedback loops that exist in order to maintain our homeostatic levels. Let's first start talking about negative feedback. This is what regulates most of the body. And in this process, negative feedback, it's the process where your body will reverse when a change is occurring. Now, before we go into biology examples, here's a simple analogy of negative feedback in your home. Here's a, a blueprint of someone's home pretend. And maybe tucked away in the utility room is the furnace. And mounted on the wall somewhere in, in the home is the thermostat. Now, the thermostat and the furnace are connected with a wire. Now, you don't see the wire because it's behind the walls, but it's there. And, of course, coming out of your furnace are all the heating and air conditioning uh, vents and ducts that will eventually bring warm air throughout your home. And let's pretend you set the thermostat for 77 degrees Fahrenheit. But in reality, let's pretend it's only 74 degrees inside your home. And so what happens? Your thermostat will turn on and send a signal to your furnace. Your furnace will receive the signal and blow out a bunch of heat through the heating ducts. And over time, over the next couple of minutes, 74 degrees become 75. 75 to 76, 76 to 77. Now that the reality has matched the set point, everything turns off. This is a great example in your home of negative feedback because your thermostat has reversed the cold change that was occurring within your house. Well, let's look at some actual biological examples next. Okay, so in this situation, we have a young child who's maybe been playing outside in the cold and in the snow in the middle of the winter. And if uh, the, you know, the longer you're outside, you're exposed to the coldness of winter and your temperature, your body temperature will start to lower. 
Well, 98.6 degrees, let's pretend that's our core body temperature, but the longer you're outside, you can see what's happening. The child's body temperature is dropping, and eventually it gets to the point where we start to shake and shiver. Well, the shaking and the shivering is designed to generate heat. You know, muscles uh, rubbing against other muscles, this creates friction and heat. And over the, the next few minutes, look what's happening to our body temperature. It's coming back closer to normal. All this shivering has produced enough heat to rewarm the body and get us back to our normal set point of 98.6 degrees. Well, the opposite of this is true as well. Here we have a young lady at the beach, nice hot day, and the longer she's out exposed to the heat of the day, look what's happening to her core body temperature. It's increasing from 98.6, now we're up to 99.7, 100.1, and eventually we all start to sweat and perspire. Well, how does this actually cool us down? Well, as the, the sweat evaporates, it pulls some of our heat away from our body. So the more we sweat, the more the sweat will evaporate and pull more heat away from our body. And as the sweat evaporates, the heat is removed from our body and eventually we get back to our set point of 98.6 degrees. Notice, negative feedback reversed the change that was occurring. Okay, so then what's positive feedback then? Well, the myth, first of all, the myth is that positive feedback is good for you and negative feedback is bad for you. But the reality is that both positive and negative feedback are crucial to your survival. You know, the examples we just discussed with negative feedback, those are very important to your survival. The reason it's called negative, negative feedback is because your body is reversing a change that's happening to you. So what's positive feedback then? This is where your body will encourage or promote a change. Before we go into biological examples, let's again look at an analogy in your home. Scattered throughout your home are smoke alarms. And let's pretend in the middle of the night a fire starts. The smoke alarm closest to the fire will probably uh, detect the smoke first and send out that loud piercing noise. Now all your smoke alarms are connected to one another and so when the, the first one is activated, it will send out an alert to all the other smoke alarms throughout your home. And they all turn on and they make that loud piercing noise to hopefully wake everybody up to get you to safety. A great example of positive feedback because the alert has been encouraged. Well, let's look at some biological examples of positive feedback. You know, first thing to mention is that Positive feedback loops tend to happen when a rapid change is needed. I already said earlier that the majority of your body is maintained by negative feedback. So positive feedback is a little more rare. So when a rapid change is needed, let's talk about, for example, when a woman is about to give birth. She begins pregnancy contractions. And in the uterus, you know, the uterus is where the baby grows for nine months, there are muscles. And when the baby is about to be born, the muscle contractions start to squeeze and eventually will help to push and deliver the child. But at first, these muscle contractions begin very slowly. Well, that's going to stimulate a nerve in the woman's uh, cervix to send a signal up her spine into her brain. The brain will receive that signal and send out a, a hormone by the name of oxytocin. And those black triangles are symbolic of the hormone. And what do you think this hormone is going to cause those muscle contractions to do? Well, ask yourself, if this was negative feedback, what would happen next? If this was negative feedback, then those hormones would end the contractions. But if that happens, the baby's never going to be delivered. So we don't want to use negative feedback in this example. In this example, positive feedback is going to encourage these muscle contractions. It's going to encourage the change. And what we mean by that is the muscle contractions are going to speed up much more rapidly. Oxytocin is a hormone that helps to speed up these muscle contractions so the baby can be born and delivered quicker, and then the mom and the child are on their road to recovery. Okay, so, you know, changing directions here. The body works together in order to maintain homeostasis. There's no one body part 
whose job it is to maintain homeostasis. It's your, really, it's your whole body working together. And we see that beautifully in what we call thermoregulation, the maintaining of our body temperature. We're going to see a lot of variety of body parts working together in order to accomplish this. For example, let's say uh, your, your skin has sensors and nerves on it to detect uh, cold. And so there is the first part of working together is your skin has detected cold temperatures. Well, what's going to happen next is that nerve, the nerves in the skin will send an electrical signal to your brain. So now we're, we're using the nervous system in order to send that electrical signal that you're cold to the brain. Well, now the brain will receive that electrical signal and the brain will respond by sending out these little black triangles or hormones. Hormones are, 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 are chemicals that are released into your bloodstream. And so now we're using the endocrine system to release the hormone and we're also using the circulatory system to pump the blood. And where are those hormones going? Well, those hormones are going to our muscles. So now we're bringing in the muscular system. And when the muscles receive these hormones, they begin to stretch and contract very vigorously and that causes our shivering. And we said earlier that the shivering will generate heat to eventually warm us back to our, 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 uh, our set point. But again, just a really nice example of the many parts that are working together to maintain our homeostatic levels. Okay, so from time to time, our homeostatic levels are disrupted. Now, in many cases, these disruptions are temporary. You know, you do enough pull-ups like the gentleman in the picture here, you're going to get some sore muscles, but that soreness is only temporary. After maybe a day or so, it's gone. Same with, for example, we've all probably been bedridden at various times, or we've had a, a bad cold, or maybe the flu, or some other infection that maybe really harmed us for a couple of days or so, but eventually our immune system fought it off and we recovered. But some disruptions are actually too great for your body to control. Now, you can see the, the toes and the fingers of this person. Uh, this person suffered from very severe frostbite. And even though their body tried to warm them up by shaking and shivering, it, it just wasn't enough to, um, to prevent this damage. And so this person was exposed to extreme cold and the sensors in their toes and in their hands are probably destroyed and 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 you can see the toes in particular are, are turning black i mean the cells of those toes are dead so unfortunately you know there's no way to you know surgically re recover from this when we look at for instance this picture of the spine you know people who suffer from paralysis well first of all when your brain wants to send a signal Let's say you want to kick a soccer ball. The brain will send a signal down your spine. The signal goes to your feet and, and you eventually kick the soccer ball. But in the case of paralysis, let's pretend that there is an injury to this area of the spine here. Your, your brain can still send a signal down the spine, but eventually when the signal reaches the injured area, the signal can't, uh, can't continue to the, to the lower part of the body. And this person would be called a paraplegic. They don't have the ability to, to move from really below the waist. Well, you can imagine if the injury were higher on the spine, this could be more devastating. The brain can only send a signal uh, down a very small portion of the spine before the, uh, the site of the injury is, uh, is, is occurred. And now the signal has nowhere to go. And this person would probably be labeled as a quadriplegic. They, they don't have the ability to use their four limbs. So unfortunately, there is a growing amount of people being diagnosed with diabetes. And let's talk about this first. So here are some cells and the cells need glucose. If you remember, glucose is the fuel that your mitochondria will take in in order to make ATP. Your mitochondria performs the action called cellular respiration. So your cells need glucose. And after a meal, the amount of glucose 
G for glucose, begins to accumulate in your bloodstream. Well, this is because your food's being digested and the glucose has entered your bloodstream. Well, this will send an alert to your brain that your blood sugar is getting high. Okay, well, notice that the glucose levels are higher right now in your blood, but those blue doorways that could allow the glucose into your cells are closed. So what happens is your pancreas will respond by releasing insulin into your bloodstream. And so here comes a bunch of letter I, I's, the I stands for insulin. So this is uh, insulin from your pancreas. And it's going to actually, insulin is going to help open these glucose channel doorways. And as the insulin is received, those blue channel doorways begin to pop open. And now the glucose can diffuse from a high concentration to a low concentration into your cells. And so glucose, as I just said, will diffuse from a high to a low concentration into your cells, thus giving your cells much needed nutrition. In the, in the, at the same time, the glucose level in your blood has gone back down and the alert is gone. Negative feedback has returned the glucose to normal levels in your body. Okay, well, well, what's the problem then? What's diabetes? Well, first of all, the process kind of starts the same. Uh, people who are diabetic, their cells need glucose as well. Mitochondria will use the glucose to make ATP. And so after a meal, after a person has a meal, the glucose is digested and it enters into the bloodstream. So the glucose levels in the blood have risen. And so like we saw before, those doorways, those blue glucose doorway channels are closed. So it's the job of the pancreas to release insulin. But people who are diabetic often have a problem seeing this. Maybe their damaged pancreas can release only a small amount of insulin. Well, this will cause maybe a couple of the of the glucose channels to, or, to open, but the vast majority of them have stayed closed. And so for the couple cells where the glucose channels did open, glucose will diffuse into those cells and, and, and they can yeah, take the glucose to make ATP, but the other cells are not getting the glucose they need to survive. And so notice how the glucose level in the blood has never returned to normal the alert is still there. The blood sugar glucose levels are still too high. Well, as the hours pass, let's say the person has another meal. The glucose levels are already high, and on top of that, the problem is compounded by having another meal. And so with the other meal comes even more glucose. And so now the glucose levels are really out of balance. And at this point, ironically, the cells begin to starve, even though the glucose, the food is so close, it's so nearby, it's just on the other side of their cell membrane, they begin to starve because they're not able to make ATP, they're not able to get the glucose to make ATP. And uh, the amount of glucose actually alters the pH. Remember we said earlier at the beginning of these notes, the normal pH of, of blood is 7.35. The uh, the pH of the blood actually falls into the acidic range, and this alters a lot of the chemical reactions that are needed to survive. And here are some of the, uh, the negative side effects of diabetes, heart disease, high blood pressure, uh, stroke, and, um, and even, even death. Well, how, are, are, how is diabetes, to, how does it tend to be treated? Well, with insulin injections. So in this case, uh, a person can inject themselves with the letter I for insulin. And by injecting insulin into the bloodstream, this, will, this insulin will cause those closed channels to open. And once they all open, I think you see where this is going to go. The glucose will diffuse into the cells and over time, the blood sugar will hopefully go back down to normal. 
Okay, and as we wrap up this video here, here's a little practice quiz for you to try. See how you can do answering these questions. And if you're in my biology class, I'm happy to check your answers before class or after class one day. Thanks for watching.